Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, welcome to our seminar on planning in Northern Ireland. Um, the plan for this afternoon is to discuss a number of topical items, including uh, the progress uh, by the Planning Appeals Commission and indeed the experience uh, with the English and Welsh Planning Inspectorate towards reopening uh, business more than, uh, than appears to have been possible to date. What's been done with regard to progressing alternatives to in-person hearings and the possibility of future remote hearings and inquiries, uh, along with uh, issues relating to vesting and compensation and some general current uh, legal issues. We're delighted that, that you've uh, joined us and I hope you find our presentations and discussion to be useful and informative. Um, my name, as many of you will know, is David Elvin, Queen's Council. I'll be chairing and giving the first paper on remote hearings and uh, I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Tim Mould, Queen's Council, and Yasser Vanderman. Can I also say thank you to Nick Grant of Landmark Chambers, uh, who's helped me uh, with a number of bits of research on the planning inspectorate uh, in uh, England and Wales. Just a couple of housekeeping points before we get going. Uh, your microphones are all automatically muted, so you don't need to adjust your local settings. We would welcome any questions throughout the session. Please submit questions using the Q&A button which uh, you should find it either at the top or bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll endeavour to, en uh, to answer any questions uh, following the last presentation. If we're unable to do so for any reason at that stage, uh, or uh, there are some questions that need a bit further thought, what we have done to date with these webinars is to send out uh, an email uh, reply to the questions uh, following the ending of the uh, webinar. If for any reason you lose your connection uh, during the web webinar, please uh, rejoin, just re-click on the link that was sent to you by email and you should be able to get back in. Thank you very much. Right. Um, I'm going to kick off by dealing with planning hearings and inquiries during the current crisis and the alternatives to hearings in person. Uh, dealing first with the position with the uh, PAC, which will be familiar uh, to all of you. Uh, I've gone through uh, in uh, date order the, uh, the various announcements that have been made in common with uh, all other organisations. Uh, the Commission uh, issued a press statement on the 18th of March saying we're going to try and keep our casework moving, but we have to keep up with current circumstances. That then led into uh, uh, written reps uh, appeals uh, for, for those that were possible. The office closed on the 24th of March. Uh, obviously, uh, no alternatives but to do that. The same happened uh, with the planning inspectorate in Bristol. Um, and, uh, and there was then a, a suspension while matters were being looked at and uh, further advice was being sought uh, as to business. Um, and uh, uh, we see in the press announcements uh, the Commission consulting uh, on uh, advice and guidance as to how to uh, go forward in what we've all found to be a difficult time. Uh, there was an announcement as to the reopening of the office on, on limited, uh, a limited basis and then we got guidance on the 1st of May uh, uh, regarding temporary response measures, um, limiting hearings and, and inquiries where written reps are not suitable, looking at the alternative technology issue that has not led at this stage to the publication of a promised protocol, though um, it's clear that these matters are proceeding. The latest announcement, which I'm afraid came too late for the slides, uh, was yesterday when the Commission announced work ongoing on remote hearings. It's had a, a consultation or engagement event at the beginning of this month with some local authorities, uh, the Planning Bar Association and the uh, RTPI, looking uh, at uh, the issue of uh, uh, work into these matters and uh, that uh, is hoping to be progressed. More as to this in a moment. Um, uh, and we see uh, matters continue. Decisions continue to be issued and reports submitted though dealing principally with uh, hearings prior to lockdown and written representations cases uh, self-evidently. Um, and uh, of course there's been the Chief Planners update on the 1st of May uh, which I think is the latest one uh, as to how matters uh, are being dealt with uh, by the department. Um, before I come to the experience uh, in England and Wales, which I thought you might uh, find uh, informative, uh, of course, there, uh, PINS has the benefit of greater manpower 
than the PAC um, and, and has uh, similarly had to uh, close down a lot of elements of its business or restrict them. Uh, just, just to mention, as I've said, the uh, PAC's announcement uh, yesterday uh, as to the various uh, conferencing and uh, remote accessing models in common with uh, a, a number of uh, official organisations considers Zoom not to be usable at the moment because it has security issues, looking instead at WebEx uh, or SiteLink. Uh, that's in contrast, I think the planning inspectorate uh, in England and Wales is looking at Microsoft Teams, but in any event, all, all organisations which require a certain degree of confidentiality are having to use or having to test uh, remote conferencing methods that have adequate security uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and the uh, Commission indicated yesterday that it's developing further guidance in respect to remote hearings and it's looking, it says, to run its first remote hearing in the next uh, four to six weeks. Well, looking in uh, comparison, uh, just to see uh, how matters have panned out in England and Wales, the Planning Inspectorate, you get a very similar pattern to uh, what's been happening with the Planning Appeals Commission. Um, you have various statements, postponements of hearings and inquiries, uh, reliance on written representations where possible, um, site visits being temporarily suspended, uh, and uh, uh, working groups set up to look at uh, virtual hearings. It's, it's fair to say that even with the greater manpower that the Planning Inspectorate has, uh, and uh, even though it has begun uh, a number of test virtual hearings, it's not expecting to roll out uh, uh, its uh, general approach and uh, usage of remote hearings for some time yet, which I'll come on to in a moment. And they've made it clear that the general principles that have to apply, public confidence must be upheld, events mustn't be downgraded. In other words, if it does require attendance in person, uh, because there's going to be significant cross-examination and significant public uh, 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 interest then it may be necessary to have hearings in person only and certainly I know of adjournments uh, of inquiries and hearings uh, on the basis that virtual hearing would, will not be good enough at least in the judgment of the particular inspector and of course a, a requirement to maintain robustness in hearings. We see then press releases indicating progress behind the scenes. The first digital pilot was to be held in May, it was set in April and certainly they have started. Um, then we get a, an important press release on the 28th of April announcing the first digital hearing, digital site visits being trialled, um, advisory meetings to discuss the progressing of local authority plans, and then the target dates. Uh, PINs have said three months to roll out good practice guidance and six months to develop capability to conduct fully digital and hybrid events. Now this isn't three months or six months from the 28th of April, it's three months and six months from the conclusion of the test hearings that it is currently running, which I don't think are due to conclude until next month. So we're looking potentially at something that runs into the autumn or possibly even late or early uh, late this year or early next year. Uh, the game changer or a potential game changer came when the minister announced on the 13th of May uh, uh, that there uh, needed to be a restart to the housing market and an important uh, ministerial statement uh, was issued, wanted to accelerate the move to digital events and the aim is to progress cases uh, of complex issues, high levels of public interest or where legislation requires. Site visits are essential but um, 60 cases in the no site visit pilot have been are, are to be conducted but he, he did say, perhaps rashly, that all hearings were to be digital within weeks. That does seem to me to be unrealistic. Uh, and you see here various aspects of his statement, the need to move to digital. You see that that's said to be critical, means adapting to working virtually, which I imagine that everybody attending uh, this webinar has already had to do uh, over the last three months. Um, expecting uh, engagement uh, proactively from all parties <clears throat> and uh, noting and this is a, a, an early indication of where certainly England and Wales are heading uh, it expects although of course uh, I should say that planning is in the hands of uh, the devolved Welsh government and the Welsh ministers and uh, that it will be their decision as to how they decide uh, to take matters forward 
but the expectation, at least for England, that these arrangements are to be made as the default method of operation in the vast majority of cases. Uh, and uh, it's going to draw on uh, emerging practice to inform policy in the longer term. Uh, statements about site visits, virtual events, fully supporting the program for moving to digital inquiries, here is meetings and events. And it, it began to become clear that the reason for very little uh, by way of virtual hearings with the planning inspectorate in England uh, is that in fact uh, ministers and the planning inspectorate are expecting to uh, affect a permanent change in how hearings and inquiries are to be conducted at least in the majority of cases and this rather explains um, the significant lack of progress in holding hearings or inquiries to date which has caused quite a lot of disquiet amongst um, uh, those seeking to develop and uh, uh, and others who have an interest in hearings and inquiries taking place as soon as possible, urgent development, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, it, it seems clear, and the planning inspector's next uh, inspectorate's next announcement uh, reinforces this, uh, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, uh, this idea that we're now going to move, at least in England, to a more permanent position of digital events. Uh, digital inspection of documents is to be the default position and of course we've all become used to that in terms of court documents and planning documents uh, increasingly over the years and it's simply become accelerated. Um, there's been other action uh, both in uh, England and Wales and in Northern Ireland in terms of allowing local authority meetings, the flexibility uh, of operating digitally even though uh, uh, technically the uh, governing statutes require the meetings to be open to the public and other uh, forms of electronic communications have had to be uh, allowed as variations to the procedural rules you have uh, your uh, temporary modifications development management uh, uh, regulations introduced last month similarly um, uh, uh, in uh, in England uh, with the amendment regulations and the uh, uh, Welsh temporary modifications and uh, the traffic orders uh, the English position was rather uh, worse off than the Northern Irish position because uh, the EIA regs 2017 already permit uh, electronic communications uh, with, uh, in terms of, electro uh, of consultation copies, consultation in Northern Ireland, whereas the English regs uh, didn't. Um, and you won't find the equivalence to the um, Northern Ireland regs, which I've listed at the bottom of the page, in the English regs and they had to introduce some uh, uh, further regulations. The planning development management temporary modifications uh, also includes, sorry, the um, development management procedure listed building and environmental impact assessment uh, regulations introduces the necessary flexibility on a temporary basis only, whereas of course it's part of your regulations already in Northern Ireland. Um, to allow uh, copies and consultation to be made electronically. So, so the latest update from PINS uh, is significant. Uh, it sets out, as has the PAC, what it's been doing uh, during lockdown. And again, uh, although there's a list of lots of cases being decided uh, in England, certainly uh, they relate to the uh, majority of cases being heard before lockdown began and to written reps appeals since. Um, and you see that uh, 10 virtual hearings have been timetabled for this month. Um, I'm not sure that it's right to say the vast majority of postponed hearings will commence in July. All the more difficult cases, which do appear to require greater public participation, uh, have been uh, almost without exception um, postponed until the autumn. I imagine in the hope that we can start doing them then. Um, virtual inquiries, uh, you'll see... Um, and to be arranged at the earliest opportunity. And it's really the, 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 the inquiries that provide the greater difficulties, the one where there is likely to be greater public participation, greater need for examination of witnesses. Um, you see that in the light of this and the timeline, uh, you, we expect a wider use of virtual events and a reduction in site visits. Uh, and then uh, you see uh, the terms here, which I won't read out, just uh, describing uh, the difficulties in anticipating uh, for future events, for the foreseeable future, we will not be arranging face-to-face -face inquiries or hearings. Um, 
case conferences are being heard, the virtual tests are going, going ahead. Statistics indicate there's been a drop in determinations, but frankly, the period that's covered, which is until late April, doesn't really tell us anything because of the Easter break, and it only really touches on the beginning of the lockdown. So statistics really won't tell us anything until later in the year. Then importantly, and I don't know to what extent uh, the Planning Appeals Commission intends to consider this itself in due course, but uh, it, as I said earlier, it's clear that the slow degree of response um, in the Planning Inspectorate in England has been because rather than simply dealing with temporary arrangements, they have determined, it appears with the agreement of the Secretary of State, to go permanently over to what they describe our standard option, which is to have virtual events. So although there are obviously issues with public participation that concerns have been expressed uh, relating to how people can uh, attend and take part, clearly this issue ex is expected to be resolved if this is to be made the standard option. Um, and it also explains to some degree whilst um, those who are keen to get on with inquiries have been frustrated with the very slow degree of progress by PINs because it's not just looking, as I say, for a temporary solution, but it's looking for a permanent solution. Uh, how this will integrate with the planning reforms which uh, the Minister here has been uh, describing in recent press releases, uh, it remains to be seen, but clearly this, this looks like it's set to happen in any event. And the indications are that, um, uh, and this will uh, have less resonance in Northern Ireland where the Planning Appeals Commission deals with its hearings uh, within a relatively uh, few days. Of course, a lot of the English inquiries run on for uh, more than a week, sometimes for several weeks, and the guidance relating to virtual events appears to be targeted at uh, hearings and inquiries of up to four or five days. We remain to see what happens with later announcements. The public interest and public participation issues uh, uh, and complaints about, well, can people get access to virtual events? Well, I mean, there are a couple of points to be made about that. Firstly, significant proportion of the population have access to the internet, and indeed lockdown has, has highlighted that. Those that don't uh, can access on most of these remote um, web technology, virtual hearing um, programs, can access by phone, if not by video. Uh, and uh, I'd be surprised uh, if anybody uh, doesn't have access to a phone to allow them to participate, and that questions and issues can be raised by email or in writing uh, with appropriate directions being set in advance. And I think the, the sort of argument that some have made, oh, well, how do, you know, people can always turn up uh, to hearings uh, and inquiries at the moment and have, have their say. Of course, there's no reason why that can't be done virtually. And of course, one mustn't forget that a lot of people complain that they don't have the time to take away from work to attend hearings and inquiries, or uh, the, uh, they're not in a convenient location for them to get to, or their transportation issues. So it would be, it would be wrong to assume uh, that uh, you are simply taking on a new load uh, of additional problems by going to remote hearings. Uh, you may have different issues, but in many cases, it may make uh, for easier conduct of uh, public participation and greater public participation um, by having uh, uh, virtual hearings. People may be able to do it whilst working from home or to attend for half an hour uh, programmed in with the agreement of the commissioner or the inspector at a, at a time when they can uh, log on uh, uh, during a, a break or in uh, uh, late afternoon or first thing in the morning. That, that There must be scope, it seems to me, for greater participation uh, uh, in the light of uh, our experience of remote technology. And certainly I've been on uh, uh, virtual events which have had in excess of 500 people attending um, uh, and certainly ones uh, with uh, multiple parties, certainly more than would attend uh, a lot of hearings and in many cases uh, in excess of those that would attend at public inquiries. So I don't think it can be said that the remote technology is incapable of dealing with significant numbers of people. And it simply, I think, remains for a, a, a decision to be made as to the procedure to be adopted. And, and one rather hoped that the planning inspectorate, with its greater manpower, would have actually done rather better than it's done to date. Um, but we will see what we see uh, when uh, they report uh, in three to five, uh, three to six months, if that is still the timescale, 
uh, with regard with regard to the uh, outcome of the trials and the and the uh, technology they propose. Final note is just to note on court hearings of planning cases. Um, Northern Ireland, generally the High Court is only progressing urgent judicial reviews uh, and uh, uh, interim practice direction, of course, was issued at the end of last month. Uh, in England and Wales, again, there are greater, uh, man, there's greater manpower available uh, to, the, uh, to the High Court and the Court of Appeal. So there have been more remote hearings of substantive matters. And certainly I know, uh, for example, fraud trials that have taken place in the commercial court with, uh, with cross-examination of witnesses by remote uh, using, I think, Skype for Business uh, and perhaps Microsoft Teams. The planning court and the administrative court, uh, it continues its urgent business but it is also progressing uh, non-urgent business, admittedly not quite as quickly uh, as normal, but it is, it is proceeding with remote hearings. Of course, you don't have live evidence in judicial reviews, so that makes life a lot easier. Mr. Justice Holgate, the lead judge of the planning court in London, has issued, um, it's not formal guidance, not a practice direction, but he sent an email to various professional channels, uh, for example, of the Planning Bar Association, to the Planning Encyclopedia and the like, uh, as to what he regarded as best practice for remote hearings during lockdown, which asked practitioners to focus on using core bundles, keeping the documents to a minimum, only relying on essential authorities and abandoning meritless points. Well, that, that to some extent has been the cry of the judiciary all the way along. What problem is, is what is someone's meritless point is someone's uh, uh, fondly uh, held and argued point. But uh, we won't go there too much, but what, what Mr. Justice Holgate is saying is use a sense of proportion, bearing in mind we're working under more difficult conditions. And indeed, the Lord Chief Justice in England has said that the court system will not go back to its pre-COVID ways. And certainly I expect that uh, digital case filing and filing of bundles and authorities and all those, those sort of things will remain electronic because they're the easiest way to process them. And uh, of course, uh, uh, it, there may be a greater uh, use of virtual hearings for um, uh, procedural hearings and, and uh, other matters which don't require the attendance of witnesses. We'll, we'll have to see where we get to uh, when we uh, come out of the more um, serious phases of lockdown, which we're only slowly emerging from. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now hand over to Tim Mould, who's going to deal with the issue of uh, vesting orders and compensation. Well, good good afternoon, <clears throat> uh, everybody. And uh, uh, may I say that um, the talk that I'm going to run through over the next twenty minutes or so is very much a whistle a whistle stop tour through what is, um, by common consent, uh, an area of law which is both complex and, to some degree, intractable. Um, and I express a view that has been given on a number of occasions by um, judges in the highest courts in the land. But nevertheless, it is uh, an area of law that um, is important, uh, certainly in in world in which uh, we are facing significant economic downturn, probably over some time as a result of the current public health emergency, and where investment in public works and infrastructure projects is one of the um, techniques, the tools, in terms of the government's macroeconomic policies, which uh, all parts of the United Kingdom are expected to pursue in order to get us back onto a course of economic health and growth. So the provisions that I'm going to run through are very well, may very well uh, become of some importance in practice for lawyers and other professionals associated with uh, the development and the infrastructure industry in, in Northern Ireland in, in the coming years. So first of all, um, vesting orders. Uh, it, it's perhaps helpful to start with the, uh, with, with the nature of the vesting order power. It is a power of compulsory purchase of land against the landowner's will. Uh, it's expropriatory and uh, it thus interferes not only with a fundamental right common law, the right of protection to one's property, but also engages Article 1 and Protocol 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which uh, is the relevant provision of that convention which protects someone's 
uh, uh, property from interference by the state. It follows that in order to um, make a vesting order, the uh, authority that proposes that order, uh, and indeed the, uh, the, the person who, who makes it, the, 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 the minister, must show that the acquisition of the land that is the subject of the vesting order is required for the purposes of the public works in question. Uh, and uh, must also show that there is a compelling case for acquisition of that land or right over land in the public interest. Uh, in terms of the convention, it's necessary to show that uh, a fair balance has been struck between the interests of uh, the private property interests of the uh, owner and the public interest in the use of the land for the purposes of public works. And compensation comes into play in this context because the availability of fair compensation is a critical part of the uh, process of securing that fair balance, both structurally in terms of the legal framework, but also in relation to the facts of any given case. Uh, I refer to a seminal decision of the Privy Council, Director of Buildings and Lands and Shunfeng Ironworks in 1995, which is a comprehensive and insightful analysis uh, by the Privy Council of the uh, fundamental principles upon which the law of land compensation uh, uh, rests. Uh, some vesting order statutes, uh, the, that, that which is of greatest significance is the Local Government Act from 1972 and in particular uh, uh, Schedule uh, 6 to that Act which sets out the procedure to be followed for the purpose of making and bringing into operation a vesting order. Uh, uh, how then uh, is a vesting order to be justified uh, under the terms of that schedule? Uh, and I've identified a number of factors that are likely to be uh, in play in, in any given case. Firstly, it's necessary for the, uh, the public body promoting the vesting order to identify the scheme and the purpose for which uh, it is being pursued. Secondly, it's necessary to explain why the scheme is needed. What is the public interest that will be served by promotion of the scheme? Thirdly, in order to justify expropriating someone's land against their will, it's necessary to show that uh, uh, but for the uh, need to acquire the land, the scheme uh, is likely to proceed. So it's necessary to show that it has the necessary development consent, planning permission, that it's capable of being financed, that it's a viable project in economic terms, and any other investment issues that arise. Turning then to the, the land in question, it's necessary to show that in order for the scheme to be pursued, the land which is the subject of the vesting order is actually required. And, for example, that there are no alternatives to the acquisition of that land that might enable the scheme nevertheless to proceed. Uh, the next uh, question is likely to be why is it that compulsory powers in the form of a vesting order are being pursued? Why has it not been possible for the parties and particularly the public body in question to secure the land by an appropriate uh, agreement? Uh, the next question uh, perhaps of less significance at the stage of whether the order should be made, but nevertheless uh, generally relevant, is what is the likely cost of acquisition? Because certainly uh, the compensation budget uh, for a, a particular scheme can uh, be a significant element of the overall cost of pursuing uh, the, uh, the scheme itself. And um, finally, as in any litigation, but uh, particularly pertinent, what terms are what are the terms upon which the landowner who is objecting to uh, the vesting order might be willing to withdraw their objection and thus enable the scheme to proceed without the need to go through the process of justifying that objection at a local inquiry uh, it's uh, important to uh, bear in mind that um, uh, the process under uh, uh, Schedule 6 allows for uh, legal challenge to uh, the making of a vesting order if it is made 
uh, in the form of a statutory application to the court, uh, which proceeds on judicial review grounds. And so uh, a person whose land is subject to a, a made vesting order, if they're aggrieved by the making of the order and feel that it hasn't been made uh, in a manner that conforms to the legal requirements, uh, then uh, they have that uh, remedy available to them. And another point which is worth noting is that um, the order uh, uh, comes into operation uh, upon the publication of it having been made in accordance with the provisions of uh, schedule of paragraph uh, five. Uh, uh, and uh, the effect of paragraph six is that once it has been uh, uh, made and has been publicized, it operates without any further assurance to vest the land in question in the public authority that has, 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 uh, has made the order or sought to make the order. Um, it, 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 the words used in paragraph 5.1 are that um, the uh, order uh, should um, be published for the purposes of bringing it into operation, quote, as soon as may be after the vesting order has been made. And uh, so uh, the longer the period of delay between the decision that the order should be made and the notice publicizing uh, that fact and thus bringing it into operation, the greater the risk in principle that those affected by the order, landowners affected by the order, may say that uh, their interests have been uh, unfairly and unlawfully prejudiced uh, by the failure to act in a timely way uh, in accordance with the powers. And for example, that they're left in a, in a state of uncertainty and blight, uh, which is unjustified uh, and uh, to invite the court to intervene in those circumstances. So uh, that's an important consideration for those who, are, uh, who have the benefit of a made order and uh, who are in the process of exercising the powers uh, which uh, accrue from, from, from that order having been made. Um, Turning then to from the process of acquiring compulsory powers under the, under, uh, under the auspices of a, of a vesting order uh, to uh, the compensation arrangements, uh, the payment of land compensation to landowners whose land is subject to acquisition uh, uh, under the terms of uh, a vesting order. I've set out the, the main uh, land compensation statutes uh, in uh, the slide that is in front of you. I shan't uh, uh, read them out. Uh, uh, and um, uh, the basic principles uh, are uh, set out uh, in parts three and four of the Land Compensation Northern Ireland Order uh, of uh, 1982. Article six of that order sets out the rules for assessment of compensation uh, and those which are of the, like, the, the greatest practical uh, value uh, uh, in, uh, in the ordinary way of things are rule two, which is the market value rule. Rule six, which preserves uh, the existing arrangements in relation to the payment of compensation for disturbance. Uh, a special rule, rule five, which deals with cases where there's no identifiable market for the land and therefore it's the value of compensation can't be assessed uh, uh, by reference to the market value rule. And then um, uh, uh, a further provision of article six, which deals with scheme disregards. I'll come to that in a moment. Article eight, which deals with the situation where the landowner has part only of his land subject to vesting, but retains land, which is uh, shown to be um, diminished in value by virtue of being severed from the land taken or otherwise uh, injuriously affected, that is to say, harmed uh, as a result of, uh, of, of, um, of acquisition. And that is obviously of particular significance to uh, agricultural holdings where, uh, for example, a road scheme uh, will take a line of a, a column of land through a farm holding, leaving severed land on either side and affecting the uh, overall performance of the farm holding, which is left in that uh, in that severed state. And then uh, articles 12 to 17, which deal with the planning assumptions that are to be made for the purposes of uh, uh, applying the market value rule. Uh, some principles that derive from uh, case law within uh, the United Kingdom. Firstly, the principle of equivalence. Secondly, the presumption of compensation for expropriation, also 
uh, arising from the, the uh, Human Rights uh, uh, Convention, the value to, the, to owner basis of assessment, and uh, the no scheme principle. And uh, the authorities I've uh, identified on that page uh, are, of, of, uh, are some of the seminal cases in relation to uh, uh, each of those uh, principles. The principle of equivalence is, lies at the heart of, uh, of, of land compensation uh, law. Uh, and uh, the thinking is that the compensation should be a sum of money that will put the landowner as the injured party in the same position as he would have been in if he had not sustained the wrong for which he's been compensated. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the value to owner principle. And those of you who practice in the field of tort will immediately recognize uh, how that uh, bears a relation to the, uh, the basic principle upon which damages are awarded uh, for negligence, for example, or indeed for nuisance. Uh, the promoter is bound to compensate the landowner for all the loss sustained by reason of the expulsion, his expulsion from his land. Uh, and the principle of equivalence is at the root of statutory compensation, which lays down that the owner shall be paid neither less, but not, nor should he receive more than his true uh, estimated uh, loss, known uh, uh, as full and fair, uh, com fair and full compensation. Uh, the compensation rules uh, set out in Article 6, I, I've mentioned that um, those which are of uh, the greatest practical value are rules 2, 5 and 6. Rule 2 is the, uh, is the cardinal rule, which says that uh, compensation for the land taken is measured by reference to its value, the value it might realize if sold in the open market by a willing seller at the valuation date. In addition to that, the landowner is entitled to receive any, um, uh, to receive compensation for any quantifiable losses that he or she suffers as a result of being dispossessed uh, from the, the land. So, uh, a land a person who is in occupation for business or for, as, as, as their home or as an agricultural holding, they are displaced from their land by compulsory purchase. Uh, they're entitled to receive uh, the sum of money that represents the losses that uh, accrue to them as a result. That is uh, what is described um, uh, as compensation for disturbance. And that is in addition to the open market value of their property, which is payable under rule two. Uh, the scheme disregards or the no scheme principle, Article 6, Paragraph 2, uh, that uh, principle was established uh, in a case called Point Gord, another Privy Council decision in the 1940s. And it says that any increase or diminution in value of the land taken that is attributable solely to the promoter's scheme is to be uh, disregarded. Uh, the reason for that is in straightforward terms because Parliament didn't intend that compulsory purchase for public works should either increase or diminish the value of the compensation payable for the land taken uh, to, the, to the landowner. Uh, he should get no more than uh, but no less than uh, the value of the land in, in the market and that land should not be, um, affect, that value shouldn't be affected by the fact of a compulsory purchase for public works. Uh, in modern terminology in uh, England and Wales, um, that is translated into what is known as the scheme cancellation assumption. That's a way of, of, of applying uh, the, uh, the, the, the no scheme principle. You assume that the scheme was cancelled at the date at which it was published. And in that way, you clear it away from the process of valuing uh, the land uh, under rule two for the purposes of establishing uh, uh, what is uh, due to the landowner by way of land compensation. And, and that is um, now enshrined in statute as a result of the English Neighbourhood uh, Planning Act of, of 2017. Uh, the basic elements of a claim uh, mentioned the land taken, the open market value rule and special cases where there isn't a market, uh, the, uh, the, the compensation is uh, assessed on the basis of the reasonable cost of reinstating uh, the uh, premises elsewhere. That is, for example, used in the case of a very special form of, of, of land and property, 
such as uh, such as a church. That's the classic example given uh, uh, in the in the textbooks. Uh, I mentioned that uh, where land retained by the owner is affected by severance and injurious affection. Uh, that is a a, a, a a matter for claim. I explained the basic uh, principles of disturbance compensation, and I draw attention to the case of Harvey, which identifies the approach that uh, somebody claiming disturbance compensation needs to follow in able to make good that claim. They've got to show that the disturbance resulted from the compulsory purchase and dispossession, that it wasn't too remote, and that it was const and they acted uh, uh, in a reasonable way to seek to mitigate the extent of their loss. Uh, again, tort lawyers will recognize uh, those principles. Uh, there's no limit in principle to the range of factors that might give rise to a disturbance claim. Uh, it's very much turns on the multifaceted factual circumstances of the given, uh, of the given case. And then plainly one is entitled to recover one's legal and conveyancing costs and other professional fees. And there are a number of statutory loss payments under the 1973 Act, uh, which uh, uh, relate, which, which are designed to give some further uh, financial remedy for uh, the fact of being displaced uh, as a homeowner or as the occupier of uh, commercial or agricultural land. I touched on planning assumptions. Um, uh, these are uh, designed to ensure that uh, when the value of uh, the landowner's land taken is uh, assessed for purposes of uh, ascertaining its open market value, uh, that uh, full, full account and full effect is given to its development potential, because plainly where land has uh, development potential, particularly where on analysis, it can be shown that in the absence of the public works scheme, it had a reasonable prospect of securing planning permission for some other valuable use, which would enhance its value over its existing value. Uh, it's right that the landowner should be able to uh, uh, receive uh, the benefit of that enhanced value. And the planning assumptions are designed to set up a statutory framework to enable that additional value uh, to be elicited. Um, so it's a further aspect of the principle of equivalence. And there is an arrangement under which uh, a, a landowner uh, and indeed a, uh, the acquiring authority, the public body exercising the power, can ask for a certificate uh, as to the degree to which planning permission might have been available for the land uh, had the uh, vesting order and had the public work scheme uh, not, been, not been proposed. Uh, turning from uh, land acquisition to uh, land be to, the, to the situation where one's land, although not acquired, is nevertheless uh, affected uh, adversely by the execution of public works. There, there is a, a right of compensation under the 1982 order, uh, which effectively is in place of an action for damages at common law. So the promoter of a public work scheme is entitled to immunity from private action in nuisance, for example, uh, uh, because otherwise uh, he, he would be unable uh, economically to proceed with, with, with the scheme. But in place of that immunity, um, uh, a right of compensation is given. Uh, uh, and uh, that uh, right uh, is intended to ensure that where the execution of public works interferes with a legal right uh, which uh, a neighbouring landowner enjoys, which they would otherwise have been able to enforce uh, in, in court by means of seeking an injunction or seeking damages, they, uh, uh, they're entitled to receive land compensation in lieu of that. And uh, it follows that the measure of compensation is the extent to which the loss of the right to enforce uh, in private law has diminished uh, the value of their land uh, in other words, the extent to which the uh, loss of the opportunity to assert their right has diminished the value of their land. And uh, uh, one uh, important facet of that is uh, set out in the case of Wild Tree Hotels in the House of Lords, which I mentioned there, uh, where the complaint is that the actual construction of the public works has given rise to disturbance through dust and, uh, and noise and so forth. 
that isn't ordinarily recoverable by way of compensation because at common law, uh, one would not be able to make a claim for damages for that kind of disturbance unless you can show that the uh, disturbance was increased as a result of negligence performance of the building works. The same principle applies in relation to public works following um, uh, 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 undertaken by a, a public body. Um, and uh, it follows also that negligent performance of public works remains actionable at law. Uh, compensation for the use of public works once they've been constructed, provision for that is made by part two of the Land Acquisition and uh, uh, Compensation Act, uh, or, uh, Land Acquisition Compensation Order of 1973, uh, and uh, uh, that uh, enables qualifying owner occupiers, residential owners, and occupiers of, of homes, agricultural units, and small business premises to recover uh, uh, a sum of money that reflects the difference in the value of their property as a result of the impact of uh, noise and dust and so forth from the operation of the scheme. So if it's a new road and their property is diminished by virtue of such factors and they can show that in a world in which the scheme wasn't running it would have been of greater value, they're entitled to recover compensation for that purpose. Um, and then uh, just turning to procedure, um, uh, the uh, compensation order sets out what is required in terms of setting out particulars of a claim and how the issue of costs is to be resolved. Ordinarily, the costs of a compensation claim are seen as part of the compensation. Uh, but in order for that uh, rule to apply, one has to make sure that one gives a reasonable level of particularity so that the uh, acquiring body is able to make a sensible judgment as to how much money they should pay you and thus avoid the need for the matter to go uh, to the Lands Tribunal for resolution. But if that is what happens, then the Lands Tribunal is there. They are the specialist body whose role is to resolve disputes about the value of land. And at uh, Article 19 of that order is a right to claim uh, payment of advance compensation before it, so that one isn't left waiting for one's money entirely uh, before the issue of how much you are entitled to is finally resolved. Um, and then uh, finally, I think, uh, I turn to blight notices uh, under the 81 order. This is a mechanism which enables qualifying uh, landowners and occupiers to um, require land that is subject to a proposed vesting order to be purchased by the public body in advance, and thus, as it were, uh, achieve certainty uh, and reorganize their lives uh, um, at an earlier stage than would otherwise be the case if they had to await the execution of the vesting order itself. Uh, and um, it's of particular uh, interest to farmers because it provides a mechanism whereby if they feel that their farm will no longer be a viable proposition, they can, uh, uh, they can take steps to uh, realize the value of their farm holding uh, at an earlier stage and uh, reorganize their life and, their, and, and, and what they do uh, for a living uh, uh, in that way. Uh, it, it, the procedure under which um, blight notices can be served and how uh, they are objections to them by the receiving body resolved is summarized on that page. And now I shall hand Tim. over to yes. Jasper. I was just going to say thank you, Tim. And uh, the final presentation is a case law update from Yasser. So yes, and would you please take over from Tim, please? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, there are many reasons why I'll be less familiar to you than David and Tim. And one of those is that I was only called to the Northern Ireland Bar last year. I actually had a fantastic time in Belfast. One, because I think it's a great city. And two, because, well, I remember the ceremony very fondly because those in charge of the Bar Library let my one-year-old daughter come along. Um, in fact, somewhere I keep a photo of um, uh, by my desk, I keep a photo of our time there, and that's us just outside the Nissi Prius court where she moments later wreaked havoc. So, I have very fond memories of my time there in my court. Anyway, um, <laughs> with my time left after that long introduction, I will um, I'll be giving you a fast paced case law update um, for cases that come about in maybe the last year or a bit longer than that in some cases. And I'm going to be covering the following themes, um, because there's a lot to get through, 
I will be um, focusing on the main points and the main takeaways rather than necessarily looking in detail at the cases, um, at the detail of the cases themselves. Okay, um, all right, starting with pre-application consultations, those arose in the Greencastle case last year. The developer, Dal Radin, wanted to develop underground mineral and mining and exploration on large plot of undeveloped agricultural land, and it was, of course, a development of major regional significance. Uh, and because it was a major development, Section 27 of the Planning Act, Northern Ireland 2011, applies, and that obliges developers to give a proposal of application notice, otherwise referred to as a PAN, proposal of application notice, to the council before making this application and then waiting at least till 12 weeks before it makes the application. Um, and that notice must contain certain things according to Section 27 and also the 2015 regs, which I cited at the bottom, which gives more detail. Um, so you have to include in that notice things like a description in general terms of the development to be carried out, but also what consultation you propose to do, how you propose to do it. Interestingly, actually, Regulation 5A of those 2015 regulations exempts the public event requirements, which it does have to oblige by oblige with during the pandemic. And compliance with Section 27 is important because the decision maker has to determine whether, in its opinion, that duty has been complied with pursuant to Section 50 of the 2011 Act. And I will underline that word because it, will, it was important for the decision in this case. The level um, threshold has to be passed. Um, now, in the Greencastle case, the PAN was a couple of sides and setting out some of the details of the application or the, the prospective application, um, you'll see that the consultation was undertaken with events and newsletters and that kind of thing. Uh, and over a, late, a year later, the planning application was actually submitted and the department determined that Section 27 duty had been complied with in its opinion. And that was the decision that, had, that was then challenged in the judicial review, saying and arguing that the, the department's decision was wrong and that the defendant had failed to comply, the developer had failed to comply with the Section 27 requirements. Um, and you can see that first bullet, they argued that, well, the original notice didn't, as a matter of fact, include some things that were later in the application. So it didn't include the removal of 30 hectares of peatland. Um, it didn't include other installations that were going to then be there, um, including sewage treatment plant, etc. And the, the thrust of the argument was that proposal consulted upon was excessively embryonic and insufficiently advanced. And in addition to that, there were some more administrative complaints, such as the, um, the public information event was moved from one location to another, um, from a neutral lo location to a non-neutral location, that the information provided at that event was insufficient and vague, that the display boards were too vague, etc. Um, complaints in that nature as well as the main thrust. Mr. Justice McCloskey dismissed the claim. Um, and because the applicants were challenging the department's decision under Section 50 and not the consultation per se, the issue, he said, was whether the department could rationally form the opinion that Section 27 had been complied with. And in trying to understand the purpose behind Section 27, the judge looked at the background to and the broader context of the 2011 Act. And this included a judicial paper on the new planning regime, which was apparently shared with the parties. It also included papers from the department itself in 2009 um, as a consultation document and a 2010 consultation response. And then at paragraph 64, the judge in this case sets out some helpful principles on section 27, including, and you see the one at the bottom I put out there, that the project concept must be sufficiently developed and advanced to facilitate informed and meaningful response from the consulted he focused on the phrase in general terms and on the other hand the project concept should be so refined and advanced as to jeopardize the whole point of the consultation which is taking into account things that happen during the consultation and maybe change the proposal sub subsequently 
Uh, and you will note that this closely mirrors the general consultation requirements that were set out in the classic consultation case of Gunning um, many years ago and affirmed more, most recently in the Supreme Court by Mosley. So using the judges are clearly using the ordinary principles, common law principles of consultation. Now the judge rejected the argument in that in doing so, my the, the applicant, that the statutory scheme overrode the common law consultation principles and required the project to be effectively fully formulated at the stage of um, submitting the PAM. And then there's a very useful section of the judgment, and I'm loath to copy large chunks of judgments in, in, in webinar seminars like this, um, but it's extremely useful in this context where you can see exactly what the judge decides here. Um, and you can see, I'll leave you to read that, but it, in essence, what he's saying is you don't have to aim for perfection at the beginning. There has to be a sufficient amount of information to elect consultation. Um, but you're not aiming for the finished product at that stage. And he then goes on to say at paragraph 110 that the statutory regime contemplates significant measures of evolution and alteration in a project concept. Now, of course, they will be aligned somewhere, but the point is that the statute has left that to the judgment of planning officers and the court should be wary of stepping in. Now, there were other issues in that case that I referred to, such as in alleged insufficient information on notice boards and information events, but those were more summarily dismissed by the judge. Moving on to the next regime, uh, sorry, the next theme, officer reports. These have been dealt with in a series of recent cases, starting with the Belfast City Council case. The council there refused permission for student accommodation, a decision which was then overturned on appeal, and the council was challenging that decision. The court took a chance to look at some more general principles uh, on, on a range of issues, including how one reads officer reports. And Mr. Justice McCloskey stated that you read and interpret them with a degree of latitude, but one still has to conduct a penetrating examination of the text. He then referred to the Mr. Justice Sullivan judgment in the Mendip case 20 years ago. Um, and in that, in that judgment, Mr. Justice Sullivan was saying that it was emphasizing the fact that officer reports are addressed to a knowledgeable readership and the adequacy of the reasoning must be considered against that background. The fact that the local committee members have substantial local and background knowledge and there would be no point in a planning officer's report setting out some of the background, much of the background detail um, if the members were already familiar with that. And several, it's worthwhile saying in the English con Welsh context, several cases have repeated that position of a relatively light touch approach to officer reports. But the judge in this case went on to say that this approach, the Mendip approach, should not be applied with a broad sweep mm. for a number of reasons, but particularly he focused on the fact that the, because of the new planning system in Northern Ireland, there was no evidential basis to warrant a generous degree of latitude and deference, I think I should say, to councils. So he's he was a bit more sceptical. And this more exacting approach to officer reports um, appears to have continued in the Connellan case, decided sometime after the Belfast case, where the same judge, Mr. Justin McCloskey, referred to the need for an intense focus on officer reports. And then we can see how that played out in the most recent case, um, Realistas application for judicial review. And that was a decision of Causeway Coast and Glens Borough, Borough Council granting permission for a hotel and spa complex um, challenged by nearby residents. The applicant argued that the officer report had failed to make it clear that the proposed main access to the development was in breach of the relevant policy because, and that's the policy AMP3, because an existing access onto a protected route was not being used. Um, now again, we see the exacting obligations on planning officers in formulating the officer report in that quote from Mr. Justin McCloskey, talking about a specific responsibility imposed on the case officer um, to bring to the attention of the decision makers and the planning committee members the relevant policy requirements in sufficiently detailed and accurate terms to ensure that they were properly understood by the reader. 
And in this case, the officer report was found to be flawed for the following reasons that you see in those bullet points. And just to highlighting the third of those, the policy requirements governing utilization of an existing access publication are not spelled out clearly or fully. And then the officer addresses the issue in a single sentence. Um, and then goes on to look at the ambigu ambiguity in the officer report um, on this issue. And my takeaway from these cases is the contrast between the English and the Welsh approach on the one hand and the Northern Irish approach on the other hand, because according to the English and Welsh cases, most recently summarised in the Mansell and Tunbridge and Malling Borough Council case, I think 2017 case, officer reports will be read with a reasonable benevolence and assume quite a lot of knowledge on the part of decision makers. And one will have to show that the officer report was significantly or seriously misleading to get anywhere. Um, contrast that with what's been said in these cases. And, and my sense is that the Northern Irish approach is much stricter. So if you were in a if you are in a role of challenging a council decision, I think it is worth time spending spending time trying to unpick the officer report and looking at it in a lot of detail. And on the other hand, if you're a council defending your uh, focus your efforts on making sure the officer reports are as robust as possible before you get to the stage of challenge. Moving then on to reasons, we can see how the court will generally approach reasons arguments, and that is one to avoid excessive legalism and rigid prescription. In other words, taking a more liberal approach to reasons, giving um, authority to the benefit of the doubt more, so to speak. Looking then at the Knox case, which then was also focused on reasons, although there are many issues in the case, this was again a development in Causeway Coast and Glensborough Council, and the officer report recommended refusal in this case quite strongly. And you can see what the development was in that first bullet. It was um, conversion of an existing building to provide a dwelling. The officer report re recommended refusal um, quite strongly on three bases. One is because it uh, conflicted with policy COU4, which prohibited development within the setting of the giant Causeway World Heritage Site. Um, subject to certain exceptions which didn't apply here and then there are also immunity issues and visual and um, landscape issues but the council disagreed and granted planning permission and its stated reasons in its decision were as you can see in the text there so uh, thread but very very um, general and um, not much detail in them um, and it's been argued by the applicant that there was a duty to give reasons on the firstly and also they were deficient here because there was no express formulation of the material considerations identified which were outweighing the policy conflicts that I've just talked about. There's no express balancing of the factors, there's no indication of the weight to be given um, and the bullet points were essentially bare conclusions without any elaboration. And this led to a challenge by a local resident and Mr Justice McCluskey found initially there was a duty to give reasons in this case arising from the council's own protocol which referred to the need to give reasons as well as particularly where you were disagreeing they were disagreeing with an officer report and then also based on the common law and referring to the supreme court decision in the cpre kent there were factors which triggered the common law duty such as the fact that there was an issue here was um, potential harm to a world heritage type there was a duty to give reasons but after a trawl of the authorities, which stretched back many years, the judge found that the reasons were sufficient. Just about. You can see that it, the judge is torn in this case, but he finds that the reasons were given just about sufficient. Um, he accepted the criticisms that just rehearsed from the applicant in this case. He accepted that they were well made. And he said it wasn't easy because they could have very, very easily, the council says, and with little effort and no additional cost, could have done so much better. But ultimately, he concluded that the low bar of the reasons duty had been satisfied. And in fact, this, this involved the judge looking at other documents, other pieces of context. So although the minutes weren't um, very helpful as to the reasons, the minutes of the meeting, there was affidavit evidence about what was said in the, the meeting. And also in a lot of reliance was placed on the pre-action letter, which set out in more detail some of the reasons uh, elaborating on the bullet points. And these are essentially whether notwithstanding the conflict in, with the plan, there were other material considerations, such as compliance with the regional plan, the fact that the site was, although it was in the landscape setting of the World Heritage Site, it was right on the edge, and that 
there were other factors such as the risk of dilapidation on the site. Moving then very briefly, it's in habitat cases. Um, first of all, looking at the SANS judicial review. This involved a permission granted by Newry, Morn, and Down District Council for a nursing home and apartments. And as you can see, it's located in and amongst a veritable potpourri of protected things. Um, the challenge had many grounds, but included habitats grounds, um, as sat out in that last bullet one focusing on article 63 of the habitat directive and two looking at regulation three and article 12 um, which is about having due regard to the prohibition of deliberate disturbance of protected species now the first of these involve looking at article 63 um, which as you may recall calls for an assessment of whether the development will likely lead to a significant effect on um, the protected area. Now SANS doesn't say anything groundbreaking on this but it is useful for a general overview of what's required looking at cases such as National Trust application, Sweetman, Champion and Leak Valley and it confirms obviously the Wensbury standard for challenging the decision makers assessment of unlikely significant effect. The specific argument involved in this case looked at whether a new assessment had to be undertaken after the passage of some time since the previous assessment, I think it had been two or three years, and elements of the application had been amended and so there was a question of whether a new assessment had been taken and the judge rejected that argument, finding that the refusal to conduct a new assessment was rational and he relied on the fact that actually the development, the amended development had reduced its size and scale and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency itself had thought that the revised proposal was highly likely to pass a revised assessment. I've also given you reference there to Blackwood, uh, the Blackwood Judicial Review, which was decided afterwards by the same judge, um, again rejecting the Article 6.3 argument. And then very briefly dealing with the other habitats point in that case, um, it was based on Regulation 3 of the Regs of Northern Ireland, which required the Council to have regard to the obligation article 12 which is set out there and Mr Justice McCloskey followed the Morge authority that's the Supreme Court decision from about 10 years ago and he emphasized the fact that the duty was only one to have regard to disturbance I the council wouldn't have to be convinced that there would be no disturbance that put too great a responsibility on the council rather the question was whether uh, a license for such disturbance was unlikely to be granted by the relevant authority and the judge thereby concluded that this less onerous duty had been discharged by the council. Finally then, looking very quickly at conditions, interpretation and amendments, um, section 54 of the 2011 Act refers to permission to develop land without compliance with the conditions previously attached, i.e. often referred to as amending conditions um, and it's materially identical to the English and Welsh version in section 73 of the 1990 Act. And so the cases I'm going to look at now are both cases from either Wales or England, but have very probable spillover effects because of the similar wording in section 54 of the 2011 Act. So these are both decided last year. Uh, and first of all, Finney, which was decided at the end of last year, the decision of the English and Welsh Court of Appeal, involves a situation where you get the planning permission but then want to change it without having to make a new fresh application in some way. And the issue is, at what point are the changes you require so significant that a new planning application is required? Uh, there were a few cases in England and Wales that allowed one to make quite substantial changes, actually. So there was the wet finishing works case in the High Court, which allowed the authority, local authority to amend a condition to allow 90 dwellings when the operative part of the permission had allowed only 84. So, and one view quite a substantial change. But this was firmly um, put in its box by the Court of Appeal, where you had a wind turbine developer wanting to amend the condition so that the height of the wind turbines could be 125 metres, rather than the 100 metres which was set out in the operative part of the permission. Now, the Court of Appeal concluded that Section 73 could not be used for this, where it would involve, the, would involve amending either, would involve amending the operative part of the planning permission which in this case referred to 100 metres, or to impose a condition which was inconsistent with the opposite part 
of the Planning Commission. And presumably, oh, and as a postscript, the Supreme Court have refused permission to appeal just a few weeks ago. So that's that's where the court case will end. And presumably, the workaround there is to seek a non material amendment of the description and then um, seek amendment of condition or to apply for a fresh new planning application, but has made that more difficult for developers. And then finally, looking at Lambeth, which actually was a case I was fortunate enough to be uh, instructed in uh, for the landowner in that case. Um, there was a home base there and the site in any event couldn't be used to sell food items. A section 73 application was made to increase the type of goods that could be sold, albeit still not including food items, and Lambeth granted this application. Um, and in the operative part of the permission, it stated what the intention of the new permission was, which was to grant the application, i.e. increase the things that could be sold on the site, but still not food items. But crucially, in the conditions part of the permission, there was no restriction on the sale of food items. And so the point went all the way up to the Supreme Court about whether they had inadvertently granted um, permission for, for, for selling anything you wanted on the site. And the Supreme Court found that found in favour of the local authority. So although it was argued that you could apply a whole term, apply terms or apply a whole condition into the planning permission, the Supreme Court found that actually on its face, one could get to the same place by construing the permission on its face. They, the, the express word of the permission were clear and unambiguous because of what was said in the opposite part of the permission, albeit there's complete silence on the conditions part of the permission. And, and there was no indication to suggest a change of intention on the part of the local authority for selling food items. Now, very briefly, this is potentially a, a hard case making bad law situation where it may suggest that one will now have to undertake more of a trawl, whether you're a member of the public, someone wanted to buy the property, someone interested in the property, you'll now have to undertake more of a trawl through the planning history of a site to see whether the conditions have been intentionally or unintentionally left out of more recent permissions and also being a general case about how you construe planning permissions has obvious relevance to the Northern Ireland context. So that's that's the end of my talk. And I think now we're going to take questions. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, yeah, sir. Um, Tim, can you uh, unmute, please? Yeah. Right. Uh, Tim, I think the majority of questions are targeted at you. Um, uh, and uh, Perhaps uh, I'll uh, uh, chip in, or Yasser can chip in, uh, with uh, uh, some of the points, um, uh, if appropriate. Perhaps we can um, talk uh, with regard to the issue of market value, and there's a question in relation to um, the relationship between Rule 2 value, uh, as it may be found uh, in the tribunal, uh, and as it may, uh, as any offers may have been made in order to try and settle the matter beforehand. Uh, and then secondly, uh, another valuation issue, there is a question uh, in relation to the impact of a valuation day coming within the middle of lockdown and the COVID crisis. Could I ask you to deal with those, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, on the first point, um, the... The, uh, the statutory measure of, of uh, compensation is uh, ordinarily set out under Rule 2, and therefore any formal determination will necessarily need to follow, uh, to, 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 to comply with that requirement. Um, concerns are often raised as to whether it is lawful for the public body who is seeking to acquire the land to offer a greater sum than they consider might be defensible uh, before the Lands Tribunal if uh, on a Rule 2 determination. Uh, to making that higher offer, if you will, for the purposes of securing an early settlement with the landowner. Uh, but uh, in, in my opinion, um, in principle, there is no um, uh, inescapable uh, obstruction uh, to taking that course. Um, for the simple reason that um, there is a value to be had in avoiding litigation and therefore a public body faced with the prospect of costly litigation to determine a value is entitled lawfully to take the view that it should offer a, slight, a rather higher sum 
uh, in order to acquire the land by agreement at an early stage, uh, both because that will avoid litigation costs, but also because it may uh, have uh, larger cost uh, savings in terms of avoiding delay and uncertainty in relation to promoting the project. Uh, it's of course necessary to be sensible uh, and to keep any additional sum or any larger offer in proportion and to be able to justify the rationale that I've just set out uh, in uh, relation to any given case. But as a matter of principle, I don't think that there is any difficulty with approaching matters in that way. As to the second question, um, if uh, the uh, application of Rule 2 of the Land Compensation Order, uh, uh, if that is required uh, by reference to a valuation date where the market uh, that the mar where market prices for land of the kind that is the subject of the valuation are affected by uh, the impact of the uh, current health emergency, then that, um, uh, that factor uh, must be taken into account uh, by the uh, valuation, by the Lands Tribunal uh, and by the parties in seeking to apply Rule 2. Uh, the question is, of course, whether uh, uh, viewing matters uh, at that date whether uh, the impact of, um, of, the, uh, of the current health emergency has had a significant effect on value. And it may be possible to think forward. For example, if land is land that was suitable for development um, at a later stage, uh, then it may be that the effect of, uh, of the current health emergency is far less pronounced than, for example, if it was a, uh, if it was a, uh, a house uh, that is subject to that, that, that is being valued in a depressed um, residential market as a result of current circumstances. So it turns on the facts, but there is no uh, there's no special legal rule that would apply in relation to to the uh, to the impact on the market of the. Of oh, I suppose I suppose Tim, what the uh, the tribunal might say, depending on the evidence, is it represent if you're looking at a two, true representation of market value. This might be one of those exceptional cases where you might take a, a look around the valuation date. You know, sometimes you can look into the future and see what happens. Yes. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the old principle uh, yes. and say, well, a snapshot of a depressed value during lockdown doesn't represent true value to owner. Uh, but that's going to turn on the evidence and it's going to turn on the evidence as to both before and after values. And depending if there is a uh, an impact on the market in that particular area for that particular use, uh, how it responds uh, as time progresses and how far it takes for recovery. I agree. Uh, and uh, uh, indeed, that's reinforced by the overarching point that I made at the start of my talk, that um, it's important to bear in mind the, uh, the, that uh, Article 1, Protocol 1 of the European Bio Convention applies and uh, uh, the Tribunal will be alive to the need to ensure that um, the uh, landowner is not um, disadvantaged uh, by virtue of um, what might be said to be, well, we hope, uh, ultimately a relatively fleeting um, uh, uh, fe uh, feature in, in the majority of our lives, not for everybody by any means, but for the majority of us. Tim, I'm, I'm going to take a question about, uh, uh, about inquiries and drought orders uh, next. Uh, while uh, I, I, what I'll do is I'll then come back to you on the question about interference with easements and rights and whether that gives rise to a claim for compensation next. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, another question that's arisen is uh, in relation to objections that are being made to a number of drought orders sought by uh, NI Water, um, of course, uh, unresolved objections are entitled to expect uh, the opportunity of appearing before uh, the WAC. Uh, and uh, the difficulty with that, I think, uh, is, is going to be um, uh, having to wait if objections are registered, which can't be resolved uh, uh, mutually, uh, is the ongoing work by um, the PAC stroke WAC as to dealing with remote hearings. And I think that's covered by the uh, points that I was making earlier and indeed by the uh, the latest press release on uh, the PACWAC's um, website for uh, yesterday, 
which says that uh, the first remote hearing is expected within the next four to six weeks, but it is still in the process uh, of formulating how to proceed. And I think this issue with regard to objections to statutory orders, not just to drought orders, but to other statutory orders as well, um, is going to be a, a matter for the resolution by the Commission when uh, it decides uh, how best to take forward these uh, public processes. And uh, I've already said that, that uh, the planning inspectorate, even with its uh, greater uh, manpower resources, is still very much taking its time to try and resolve how to deal with these matters uh, fairly and robustly. Tim, uh, I think the, the next question is the impact uh, on compensation rights uh, if a vesting order interferes with an easement or, or other uh, right, I assume property right or potentially even contractual right, I suppose. Yes, um, I see that the question is posed on the basis of whether an interference of that kind is, is compensatable under uh, Article 8 of the compensation order. I think ordinarily uh, uh, an interference of that nature would fall under the uh, ambit of Article 18. Uh, I mentioned um, the, uh, that compensation is available where the execution of public works uh, interferes with or causes injurious affection to a neighbouring landowner and that certainly embraces uh, interference which involves um, cutting off or making less convenient a right of way uh, or um, affects a right to light something of that kind and that's indeed that's one of the classic situations in which compensation would be available under under article 18 and the measure of of, of, of loss would be the degree to which the um, the uh, dominant tenement, to use property lawyer's language, the, the, benef the land benefiting from the, the, the right of way or the right to light the easement, the degree to which that land is diminished in value through being deprived of the right or having that right made less uh, convenient to the, to, to, to the owner of the property. If the case is that um, the, 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 land, the, the, the land within the holding is subject to outright acquisition by virtue of a vesting order, and then other land within the holding is retained, uh, but the effect of um, acquisition is to interfere with rights which would, which 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 remain, uh, uh, such as, for example, an access or something of that kind by the effect of severance. Then that would come within the overall assessment of compensation under under Article 8. It would be a, a, an aspect of severance and injurious affection. So if no land is taken, but a right is interfered with Article 18, if some land is taken, but land retained is affected in the way that the questioner has posed, then I think Article 8. But in each case, the measure of loss will be the extent to which the interference diminishes the value of the land in question. Shall I just pick up on the question whether there is an equivalent to section 203? Uh, would, would you please? And yeah. uh, we'll need to bring matters to an end in a, in a, in a minute or so, but uh, if you could deal with that, please. Uh, so far as I'm aware, and I've, 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 I've looked at this in the past and I've looked at it again over the last few minutes, there is no direct equivalent in Northern Ireland uh, statute law to section 200, 203 of the Housing and Planning Act 2016. Um, so, um, so the question, so in order to, to address that point, one well, would need to fall back on um, we seem to have uh, seem to have lost Tim. Um, what I'll do is I'll bring um, the discussion to an end and we will deal with the any unanswered. Sorry, sorry, Tim, we lost you for about 15 seconds. Uh, would, 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 would you excuse me for interrupting? I, I was just going to bring matters to a close and say that ah. we'll deal with any unanswered matters. We'll circulate uh, uh, short email replies to unanswered questions uh, once we've concluded. Since Certainly. we're, we're approaching uh, the cutoff point. And can I thank uh, everyone for attending uh, and uh, uh, to uh, Yasser and Tim again uh, for their papers. Thank you all very much.